In this video, Dr. Jordan Peterson explains the circuits in your brain for addiction and why you relapse. So, all right, so you're going from point A to point B and you see your tools. You go along, you see these tools. These are things that are going to help get you to your goal. And whenever you see those, then you get a burst of positive emotion. And basically that means two things, that positive emotion. Think about it as a little dopamine kick. And this is where this story differentiates a little bit from classic behaviors. So the behaviors would say you get a little dopamine kick and that increases the probability that the action that you just took will be taken again in the future. And so, so it's partly because the dopamine kick has a positive emotional, uh, it provides a positive emotional experience, but it's also because the dopamine facilitates neural growth. And so if you're beetling along and something good happens to you, then your brain makes the things you were doing, the circuits that underlie the things you were doing just before the good thing happened, a little bit stronger. But, but the other thing that happens when you're beetling along and doing your positive thing is that you get a little dope, is that the fact that it's working also validates your frame of reference. Because, you know, you might say, well, if what you're doing is working and you're getting what you want, how is it that you're right? And the answer to that is, well, in some ways, you're right enough up the entire hierarchy. And so what that means is that every time you proceed along the path that you've chosen and that's working, that that entire structure gets stabilized a bit more. And that's how it should be. Now, I, I've tried to work out exactly how this happens. And, and I think I can give you the best example by telling you about cocaine addicts. So, addicts used to have this phrase, monkey on my back, and that phrase referred to the compulsion, the compulsive subpersonality that develops that's interested in nothing but more of the substance. Now, you know, you think about that as being hooked, and you might think about it as a motivational drive or a biological drive, but the thing is, it's not like that. It's, we're just not that deterministic. An, an addicted person has grown an addictive subpersonality. And I mean grown. It's not psychological. It's psychophysiological. And so, so imagine this. Imagine this is how it works. Okay, so, and I'll, I'll, okay, I'll first tell you what happens to cocaine addicts if you take them out into a treatment center. Heroin addicts is the same thing, roughly speaking. So you take this person who's dependent out to a treatment center and with heroin say you, you have to let them go through withdrawal and that takes about 48 hours something like that and you've seen movie representations of it but it's been compared by reasonable observers to having a very bad flu so alcohol withdrawal by the way that kills you often you have a seizure and you die. And so if you're an alcoholic and you go to the hospital and you need to detoxify, they'll give you Valium or something like that so that you don't seize yourself to death while you're withdrawing. You know, when you have a hangover, part of that is, is that part of what's happened is you've actually lowered your seizure threshold. So something to think about if you're, you know, if you're prone to seizures, it's a bad idea to have a hangover. In fact, they bred mice to study hangovers. They bred mice that could drink alcohol and then they'd get a very bad hangover and if you showed them a cat they'd have a seizure so because the fear was enough to trigger seizures yeah so well, you gotta get seizures going somehow if you're gonna study them and that's so and, and that can be bred so so anyways you, you take your your heroin addict let's say and they get over their 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 withdrawal and so that means that Technically, they're no longer physiologically dependent on the drug. Now, that doesn't mean that their work is over by, by no means. But frequently in a treatment center, as long as the person is nowhere near where they usually are, once they've gone through withdrawal, they can stay away from the drug quite effectively. But the problem is, as soon as you put them back in the situation that they came from, they, and they're around the things that have been associated with heroin, let's say, they get a craving, and the cravings haven't gone away. That's a different system than the system that went through withdrawal. And so they always relapse. So now, 
you think about how this craving works, and I, I've seen this probably most seriously, I guess with cocaine addicts, but also with alcoholics. So imagine, the, imagine what you have to do in order to become an addict. You know, the first thing is you have to start using the drug. Okay, but that, but, and, and, and fair enough, so people experiment with all sorts of drugs, and so, you know, that's part of human nature. So, you know, it's risky and dangerous, but it's not yet catastrophic. Okay, but then let's say you start using it enough so that you, you can't not use it, you have to use it every day or something like that. And then the, the next thing that happens is that gets a little bit expensive. And so then your life is starting to go downhill because you're spending all your time trying to gather resources to get some more of the drug. Now, what you might ask yourself is what do you have to, like exactly what's the chain of behaviors that's being reinforced by the drug? Well, somewhere along the way, you know, maybe when you're just starting to misuse it, there's part of you that's saying, you know, really, this is probably not a good idea. And then there's another part of you that has a different thought, which might be, oh, to hell with it, it's only once. It's only tonight. And so then you take the drug. And then there's a chain leading from the thought to the drug behavior. But the drug reinforces all the way back along that chain. So what happens is that little system that thinks, oh, to hell with it, it's only one night, gets a little stronger. Now, it doesn't get as strong as this, the systems that are being reinforced that are activated directly before the drug, the drug hit. But the thing is, is that maybe you take heroin in 50 different situations and so you're conditioning yourself to cues in all those different situations you use slightly different behaviors and so on so there's different things being shaped but one of the things that's always being reinforced even though not that much is this thought pattern and the thought pattern is something like well to hell with it doesn't matter anyways because you have to think that in order to especially at the beginning of a nice downhill trip you have to think that and so what happens is you build this monster in your head that's full of lies and rationalizations. And they're whatever lies and rationalizations allowed you to continue the behavior to begin with. But you're making them more and more potent. And so you build a sub-personality inside of you that is it's a one-eyed monster, fundamentally. All it wants is the drug. And it's armed with any number of perfectly depends on how smart you are, you know, like you can, you can come up with a very powerful, nihilistic, rational argument why, about why life is futile and your future's dead and there's nothing better to do anyways and you'd be a fool to be engaged in such a destructive society and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Like you can, you can conjure up a very, an argument that's virtually impermeable to rational, to rational argument rational counter-argument because you know there's some things that you just can't prove like you can't prove that life is intrinsically worthwhile you know because well for obvious for obvious reasons so now the reason I told you that is because I think it's a good example of how things are nested inside of each other you know and also the relationship between this, this very large nesting of concentric lenses, let's say, and the way that those things are shaped and reinforced across time. Whenever you're acting locally and something goes the way you want it to, let's say, and not the way you expect, because that's what Sokolov and Vinogradova and, and Jeffrey Gray and the people who were looking at the orienting response first presumed. They presumed that you wanted things to go the way you expect, but that's not exactly right. And it's an important distinction. You want things to go the way you want them to go. And if it's just expectation, then it's a cold cognitive model of the world, right? It's like a robotic. Okay, A happened, now B should happen, now C should happen. It's like, that isn't how you think at all. You're always inside a motivational frame. And it isn't only that you expect the next thing to happen, but if the next thing happens, it matters whether it's what you want or not. If it's what you want, then that little system is reinforced. You, it's pleasurable for you, and then the whole hierarchy grows a little bit stronger. And if it is not what you want, well, then you have a problem. And that's where things get weird and interesting.